how to be an entrepreneur. But the main thing we try, we're trying to do is we're trying to bring 15 to 20 real entrepreneurs to class. This is our sixth or our seventh. What business did you start? How did you start it? If you're interested in this, it's a seniors only course in the business department, Midwest Entrepreneurs. And our class is here today. They're having an official class. They have assignments for this. The rest of you, I assume, are here because you're interested in learning, and I'm glad to see you. I'm going to let Professor Kaepner, my partner, introduce our speaker. OK. I also want to welcome everyone. It's great to see so many people here. Um, our speaker today is Dwight Tierney. Uh, Dwight, I just met Dwight for the first time last night. And I had the pleasure of hearing a little bit about his background. And I'm going to give you just a couple little things and then let him elaborate on his background. Uh, Dwight, among other things, spent 27 years from the beginnings of, of MTV to the, uh, at, the, at the pinnacle of, of, of Viacom and Nickelodeon and all the other things that Viacom does. He was... He saw it all from the beginning to to uh, to pretty much what what they are today. Um, he also uh, was uh, one of the senior executives, C-level executives at Madison Square Garden. And of course, you know they own the Knicks and the Rangers and do all kinds of concerts and all kinds of things. Uh, so. Uh, uh, he just recently, I think he told me 37 or 47 days ago, one or the other, uh, just uh, retired. And uh, so uh, anyway, it's almost like uh, we want to both uh, welcome him here and congratulate him on his retirement. So please welcome Dwight Tierney. class is officially supposed to last for 75 minutes, but anything that gets us close to 4 o'clock on one side or the other will work. Okay, good. <laughs> um, if I'm boring you, just don't tell me and you can hold down. Um, a whole bunch of things, I got a million things I would probably like to talk to you about. We could talk for hours and hours. But I gave the, uh, the commencement address here uh, six, four, four, maybe about six years ago. And at the, as part of the address, I started it by saying a couple of things. I said that the Chinese prefer red wine. Visiting day at Abu Dhabi prison is a Wednesday. And the former mayor Giuliani does not have a hip bone in his body. And I said those three things for a reason. I got enormously lucky in my career. And I got to spend time with Mayor Giuliani in producing the Video Music Awards in New York City um, and having a party in Central Park, in Bryant Park, for 5,000 people and dealing with the Mayor of New York on that. And when he asked me the question, who's going to be at the show, I, I went through the band, I told him the bands, and I said, in Green Day, and he said, it's so good you've got an environmental interest in this thing today. <laughs> the Mayor, I was thinking, no, Mayor, not exactly. But, um, the second thing is, I was with the, Chi the MTV was trying very hard to break the Chinese market, as you would. You know, a whole bunch of people watching TV, two billion eyeballs, sets of eyeballs. Um, enormous potential market, as everybody in, in commerce knows. So we were dealing with the government, which controls television there, and who gets on television there. And I'm sitting across from this guy, and we're talking about getting MTV into China. And I realized the guy I'm sitting there, and, and we're sitting drinking red wine, and all of the Chinese delegation are drinking red wine. And I was going to order a bottle of white wine, and, the, and the, the, the waiter came over to me and whispered in my ear, the Chinese only drink red wine. Whether that's actually true or not, that's what the only people, they, that's what they drink. So it always registered with me as part of sitting there drinking red wine with a guy who's going to make a decision of what two billion people are going to watch on television. And I'm a guy from Monmouth College. You know, I spent four years in a small Midwest college. What am I doing here? I had the same thing. We had an American who was arrested and disappeared in our Middle East business. And it took us days to find him. We discovered he was in Abu Dhabi prison. And the reason he was there was because it was, uh, uh, he had been accused of a domestic violence issue, which do prove not to be true. But the Emirates, as enlightened as it is when you compare it to the rest of the Middle Eastern world, in the Arab world, has a very, I mean, and this goes against probably what most of us 
intuitively think. Women are protected tremendously when it comes to domestic violence issues in, in, in that part of the country. All you need to do is be accused of striking a, a spouse or a woman and you'll be put in prison. And the difference there is no one has to file a charge against you. You just go to prison and they'll, they'll get around to you someday. So I tell you that because we couldn't find this guy because no charges had been pressed and they would get around to him. So anyway, I finally, we finally discovered he was in Abu Dhabi prison. Abu Dhabi prison is this prison in the middle of the desert, that if somebody did escape, the guys in the guard tower could say, let's go to lunch, we'll get them in an hour, because it's sand for miles and miles and miles. But we had to negotiate with the, with the commandant of the prison to get this guy out of the prison. One of the scariest things I've ever done in my career is every time you walk through a door, they close one behind you. All of a sudden, you're through like four levels of doors, and there's no way out. And your irrational mind starts thinking, well, I'm not getting out of here either. But again, it was, what am I doing here? I'm just the guy from Monmouth College. What am I doing here? But Monmouth helped prepare me for it, interestingly enough, in the way you dealt with other human beings, the way you communicated and demonstrated an interest in other human beings. But we'll talk about that later. We'll talk about it. Let's talk about this. I was here for four years. I graduated in 1969. The first thing I did for really, really good reasons was take a job in the admissions office as an admissions counselor. And the really, really good reasons was my girlfriend was a junior, and I wasn't ready to break up with her. So very grown up, very mature reason to take a job. The other reason was I was not prepared <coughs> emotionally to separate myself from the experience of college. Not another great, re another not very good reason to take a job. Anyway, I took this job. Monmouth invested a car in me, an expense account in me, and said, go forth and recruit west of the Mississippi River. I hated it. I really, really hated it. And I sucked it. It was really bad. <clears throat> so there's a guy named John Wilbur who ran uh, admissions at the time, who drove down to St. Louis and said, Dwight, you do suck at this, you're fired. And I got fired. So my connection, my last connection formally with Monmouth College is, you guys fired me. <laughs> <laughs> The day I gave the speech, the, the commencement address, President Giese was, was, was president. He didn't know that. And I said to him, Dick, I talk about this in my speech, but I talk about it as part of what you do in your life and how things change and alter your life. And he said, would you do me one small favor? He said, would you make sure everybody knows it wasn't me who fired you? <laughs> but we, we, we gave Dick that break. But it was John Wolper who fired me, and, and John was right to do so. I had no passion for what I was doing no real interest in what I was doing, and no good reason to be doing it, and I deserved to be fired, and I was. So I kind of languished in self-pity in St. Louis for about three months, and then finally decided I was going to go back to New York where I was born and raised. I went back to New York and thought about the fact that the one thing John Wilber did say to me, he was a lovely man, as a matter of fact, John said to me, you really need to find out what it is you do want to do. What kind of floats you up? What are you, what's going to make you feel good about getting up in the morning and doing something. So John gave me that. The more I thought about it, the more I thought, I really want to be involved in the media, entertainment, television, movie business, music business. That's what I think I really could enjoy, and I think I could probably be good at it. So I banged on doors, and I got a job as a, as a, as a part-time, a piece worker copywriter for ABC, uh, for J. Wilson Thompson Advertising. And I wrote promotion copy for tune-in stuff, you know, like, Tune into uh, what is it? Modern Family. Oh, well. and I write something supposedly amusing or funny, and I only got paid if they used it. But it connected me to the media business and the business I wanted to be in, and I kept moving ahead and moving ahead and moving ahead. And I finally, ultimately, I wound up working at CBS, and I was in strategic planning and business development, and eventually got involved in executive compensation and leadership development kind of things. And I was having a great time. And at the time, CBS owned, CBS, they were dating myself, but that's part of this deal here, is there were, in any of your neighborhoods, there were maybe five television stations. There were the three networks, and there were only three, ABC, NBC, and CBS. And then there were probably two local stations in your community. That was it. You had a choice of about five, six stations at the most. And CBS was the Rolls Royce of network television, broadcast television. So working there was a big deal. 
And I was there and I was learning. But CBS also owned what has now become Sony BMG Music. So they own Columbia Records and Epic Portrait and Associated Labels, and they owned they were a huge music company as well. So I was very involved and I got to know those guys and worked a lot with them on strategic planning. And one of the things I learned about were music videos. Music videos in the late 70s were purely to distribute, to help pe help our record guys sell records to retailers, job, job shoppers, rack jobbers, anybody who bought records to sell to the public. And the reason you use music videos is all these retailers want, they want the hits, they want the super bands, they want the stars, they don't want new bands. Because new bands take up inventory and they don't make money on them because nobody knows who they are. So what music companies did is they would get performance video. Performance video is very simply bands up there playing their music. And they would show them to the rack jobbers and the retailers and they would say, oh, okay, yeah, fine, I'll take a chance on this group. Uh, just as a side note, you guys know who Meatloaf is? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's Meatloaf's entire career is based on the fact that somebody saw a video of him and finally believed that a 300 pound guy could be a rock star. <laughs> His whole career was based on music video. The beginning of music. So, good business, good idea to do this. While this was going on, they were using this purely as a merchandising tool. There were these two guys in England, Godley and Crane, and they were music guys. But they also saw music video as an art form. So they started creating a concept video, mini films, you know, stories, whatever they might be. And they thought that music could be sold that way, not just with performance video. So they started to do that. And there was a guy in the United States named Mike Nesbitt, uh, who was one of the monkeys, uh, for those of you who know the monkeys form, or are. Uh, and he was one of the guys who knew how to play in ministry. I don't think that very many of them did, actually. But, he was also a musical visionary, and he started creating concept video. And that's how music video started to make us move into America, concept video. So anyway, I'm at work, and a couple of guys call me one day, and they said, look, we're going to start a business. We think we got an idea for a business. Uh, what is it? We think we can put music videos on television, on this new business, cable television, and make a whole bunch of money. We think this is a cool idea. I said, Dude, that's a totally cool idea. I had three kids, a mortgage, uh, and a mother who thought I was the most irresponsible guy in the world. I was quitting this job with CBS, which was like famous television, with a good job and a good future, and I took a pay cut of about half, and, but uh, I saw what the guys at CBS had seen in the beginnings of their career. He was pioneering. I listened to the, the old timers at CBS talk about what it was like. There were no rules. They made it up as they went along. If they screwed up, they'd get up and laugh it off and do something else because they were creating a business in the late 40s and early 50s that had never existed. They used to sit and listen to these guys and go, wow, that's amazing. Wouldn't it be great to be able to do that, to be a pioneer in something and to be able to do that where you love it? So lo and behold, here comes cable television. Uh, two minutes on cable television history. Cable television was created in and I keep saying I don't remember which valley, in Pennsylvania, it's either the Lehigh Valley, it's a valley in Pennsylvania, trust me on that much. It was done by a guy who sold television. He had electronics, an appliance store, and he sold TVs. But because of where he lived, nobody bought TVs because they couldn't get a signal, they were in this valley. And broadcast TVs meant the antennas, just the old fashioned antennas, but because you're in the valley, the antenna didn't work anymore. So he couldn't sell any television sets. So he finally got an idea that if he went up to the hills around the valley, he put poles up, and he ran cable to the community, he could get them a signal, and then he could sell television sets. So there you go. One guy who wanted to sell television sets basically created an industry. I'm sure he didn't come to that. So from that, <coughs> cable became reality. From there, there were pole climbers, telephone pole climbers, the guys who used to, and I guess they still do it. Hang the pole, you know, pull, a, pull a cable between telephone poles. Who started to think, well, wait a minute, I could be doing this for me instead of the phone company, and creating businesses all over the country, little cable companies all over the country. And I could start to do that. And that's how commercial cable television franchises began around the country. So all of a sudden you've got this, and it started to make sense. People were in, in remote areas or in areas that had never been able to get television before were getting television. 
excuse me, so all of a sudden, all right, how are you going to fill this pipeline? Because you've got you know, this amazing opportunity that's not regulated the way broadcast television is regulated. There's more freedom to it, uh, less regulation, less censorship, real creative opportunity. So guys started thinking, well, we can make cable television channels, content providers. So the content provider business became business plan. <coughs> the business plan is something very rare, a dual revenue stream business. You've got subscriber revenue because you go to the cable up there and say, well, if you want MTV, we're going to charge you three cents per subscriber on a monthly basis. <coughs> and I think that's what we did charge you originally, three cents per subscriber. Well, that's selling a lot of money until you start talking about 50 million subscribers. So now it's three cents, four cents, five cents times 50 million times 12. And it's usually these deals were done in three-year deals. So now you've got a three-year guaranteed revenue stream. You can invest in your business. You have money because you know it's coming in. It's not a variable. So you can invest in your business, grow your programming, acquire programming, and you can look at the second revenue stream and drive it by increasing your viewership, and that's advertising revenue. The advertising revenue part of the business in 1981, we promised we would do $7 million. We did four. In 1982, we said we'd do $7 million. We did three. In the summer of 1983, late summer of 1983, the two owners of MTV were Warner Communications, which is now Time Warner, and American Express. We're going to pull a plug on MTV. So MTV was 90 days from being done with because we had missed our numbers so much. And then something amazing happened. We got distribution in New York City. Now, not just because there were a whole bunch of people in New York City. I think that's almost beside the point. The point was the advertising community in America lives in New York City. Madison Avenue is really true. That is Mad Men, you know, take it to the modern day, that's where they are. The center of advertising is there. And now, because we were distributed and being shown in the New York City community, they saw us in real time. And they'd go home at night. And their kids were watching us. And they were going to the mall. And, and they were seeing kids with t-shirts and hats. And all of a sudden, they saw this was a business. And all of a sudden, the revenue started to change. So all of a sudden, the revenues, next year we said we'd do 7 million, we did 14. Next year we said we'd do 21, we did 42. Next year, and on and on and on. And the business became a remarkable success. But one of the keys, again, was the distribution of the New York City. So, me. Went to work there, quit my job, went to work there, listened to my mother yell at me about being responsible. Um, and found that passion. Found the opportunity to be a pioneer and do something that had never been done before. Experienced what these guys talked about, about falling flat on your face and failing miserably and getting up and laughing and learning from the experience and doing something else. And continuing to do that. Going to Ohio and seeing that they have this, this local Columbus, Ohio cable operator has created this small children's programming for their local community. They did it just so they could say, we deserve the franchise in your community because we're such good guys and we love children. You've got to give us this. So, and they got the franchise. But we saw the programming. And we said, we'll take it off your hands for a buck and a half. And they said, yeah, just fine. We don't want anything to do with it. We renamed it Nickelodeon. So Nickelodeon went from this local little tiny Ohio-based programming service to the largest children's network in the world. Um, because of people's vision and passion, and because of what they thought about what could be done with something that had you know, a kernel of potential to it. Now, the guy, the, there were 26 of us when we started. And we all came from very different backgrounds. Um, the guy who became the creative force behind, behind MTV is a guy named Bob Pittman. <coughs> and he didn't come up with the idea of MTV, but he took the idea and made it the creative place it was and the success it was for many, many years. And he came out of radio. He was a radio programmer at WBBM in Chicago and the WABC in New York. That was a guy who was a research professor at State Florida State University. 
who was a brilliant consumer research guy. Young guy. Well, we're all pretty young. We, you know, I don't think any of us were 30. Uh, which bothered the cable operators. Because I don't know, these cable operators were these tough guys who had been telephone pole climbers for years. And they saw a bunch of young guys coming in saying, well, you should go rock and roll on television 24 hours. And they're like, nah, we don't think so. So we had to convince them that they weren't the audience. You guys were the audience. Now that's where research and marketing and entrepreneurism comes into play a lot here. Each of the guys who came, and I say guys interchangeably, forgive me for that, that's, I just say that. But the men and women who worked at MTV in those days, the 26 original people, were all entrepreneurs and risk takers. We had to be, I, mean, I told you, you know, personal business, I cut my income in half with, with three kids and a, and a mortgage. I wasn't the only one, the other guys took more, took more risks. And we didn't know if it was going to happen. We had no idea if it was going to happen. But it was, again, that passion and the vision to the whole thing. And the, out of the 26 of us, maybe four of us were, had worked in corporate, in corporate environments. A lot of guys had either worked academically. They had worked as entrepreneurs in other areas. A couple of guys had worked uh, for their parents' businesses and had really never had structured business before. And so what, when we started the business, it was like, well, you're good at that, so you do that. Well, yeah, but I never did that before. Well, okay, you're good at that, so you do that. There weren't titles. There weren't like your VP of Human Resources and Administration, and you were the head of marketing. It was like, you're good at that, so you do that. And if you can do that good, we'll give you something else to do. And that's the way it grew. And it was all risk-taking. And there, it's some interesting things that happened from that. There are people who are exactly the right people and the right time for that to happen. In the early days of MTV networks, there were people who were brilliant at that entrepreneurial, let's get this thing started. But as soon as the business became a serious business, they couldn't make that leap to the next step. So regrettably, business being business, you've got to find the people who can then do that. And hopefully with some dignity and respect, convince the guys who helped you to get to here that they should try that doing that someplace else because they're not going to be able to do that. It was a very sad time in the, in, the, in the MTV evolution, but it was necessary because there really are people who can get you just that far and then you just need a whole different skill set to get you to the next level. But again, the, the, we kept going back to the same thing. The same, guy, the same guys came back to the same thing. We, are all about, we have to be about marketing, we have to be about branding, we have to be about research and marketing research. I learned and lived in research and have been convinced that I would become a missionary uh, in any communication about the importance of research and market research. The success of MTV networks, all of those networks, is because of the research that they do. They know their customer. They know you guys. Dirty little secret, I was talking about this earlier, is MTV is known as, the, is, as kind of a, 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 a cultural icon in the sense that we kind of show you what's happening. We tell you what the trends are, what the fashion is, what the lifestyle issues that you're aspiring to are, what these things all are. And the dirty little secret is you told us. You just didn't know you told us. And then we've articulated and recreated and put it in a way that you guys think we're really smart and you think we're really cool because we're showing you this stuff. You told us. Because we've talked to you and we've researched you and we've asked you questions and we've had focus groups and you tell us what you like and what you don't like and what you think is completely, you know, phony. Uh, and you've done that. So it's you who's basically told us. So the third little secret about our success is basically we just take what you told us and put it more articulated a month before you did. And we've been able to stay ahead of the ahead of the curve that way. The business always stayed ahead of the curve. The same with children's programs. Uh, we were just talking about before, Nickelodeon, in the early days of its success, before it's, it was a nice business, it was a good business, but it wasn't an amazing business. And we went and we did a lot of research. But one of the things we did is we did a lot of call-in research, which still happens today. We you'll call somebody and what are you watching, what are you doing, what, what kind of program do you watch, how often do you watch TV? And we would do it at 6.30 at night because we knew that the parents would be home, we knew something. And we would talk to them. Parents had no idea what Nickelodeon was. They knew their child was watching children's television, and it was good children's television. They never thought, I mean, you don't think to yourself, I'm watching NBC. You're watching uh, you know, 
Law and Order. You're not watching NBC, and you're not watching uh, ABC because of Modern Family. You're watching Modern Family. So people don't, as a rule, say, well, I'm, he's, he's watching it below. He's watching a kid's show, and he's great, and it's telling him, it's teaching him, and he's being educated, and he's entertained at the same time. I'm thrilled. But they don't know what's going to play. So they go, eh, and then they hang up. So we had no data. So we realized we were talking to people this tall. We should have been talking to people this tall. So we started talking to people this tall. And it went like, once we talked to those people, our business went from that for years to that. It quadrupled in three years. Because all of a sudden, we were dealing with our audience. <laughs> so the key for us has always, has always been know your audience, know your consumer. Know what they think, know what they feel, know what they want, and know how to deliver it. Now let's talk a little bit about delivery, entrepreneurism. Uh, Dwight, can we, uh, uh, usually what we do is we do about 30 minutes, and then we get a chance to ask some questions. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Or do you two have? Minutes, okay. And then absolutely. All right, great. Um, the, one of the key successes to the businesses at NTD Networks is branding. Branding, you know, I mean, if you see the MTV logo, you know what that is. It is the equivalent. It has the brand recognition. Well, the last research survey that Gallup did and uh, one of the other major uh, guys did now says that the MTV logo is more recognized than Kleenex. And that's pretty cool because you don't, people don't buy, there are 50 different kinds of a tissue paper you can buy, but nobody buys tissue paper. They buy Kleenex. So to have the brand recognition that exceeds that with MTV is pretty remarkable. Um, but the way you do that is you're making a contract with you, the end user. This is what we promise you. This is who we are. This is what we're going to be. If you come to us, this is what you're going to get. And that will change over time. It will evolve over time. Obviously, MTV was 90% video and 10% other programming. And now, six months ago, we took, they took the name music out of the name. It's now just MTV, not MTV Music Television, because they realized that was hypocritical at this point. So it's now because there's very little music on MTV. It's program, it's long form programming, reality programming, scripted programming, and because it's evolved and the ratings are exceptionally high, and that's the way it should be. Things evolve, but you still make the contract with the consumer. <coughs> this is your brand. This is what it's going to look like. This is what we're going to deliver. We're not going to lie to you. This is who you are and what you're going to get. So that you can rely on that and trust that. Whatever the evolution of programming might be. Same with Nickelodeon. Nickelodeon has one color and one color only. Orange. And then it's a very specific orange. It's called Pantone 2. There isn't anybody who works at Nickelodeon or MTV knows who doesn't know that color. Because it can't be burnt sienna or a different orange. It's Pantone 2 orange. That's it. And it won't ever change. And that's, you see it, you know it's Nickelodeon. So, anyway, we, we can talk more about other stuff uh, about that if you want to. But I want to make sure that you guys are marketing and entrepreneur folks, so I wanted to talk a little bit about how we got where we got this. Okay, on the nose. So I'll, I'll start, and then you all can be thinking your, of your questions for Dwight. Um, Dwight, we have some on, future entrepreneurs in here. They, they want to eventually start their own companies, but a lot of them are saying, hey, I want to go work for somebody first who knows what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Comment on that strategy, and then also, um, as the head of human resources for Madison Square Garden, you know about people who are valuable and those who are, dis uh, are, are not so valuable. And so if you could comment as to what students can do to prepare themselves, because you said, hey, at the beginning of MTV, we needed this. Mid-stage, we needed that. And you know, when we were a global company, we needed this. And those weren't all the same skill sets. So how do we become versatile and, um, and be, become indispensable to, to someone like you yourself? The, um, the idea of being a, the, entre, the idea of an entrepreneur working for somebody before they decide to go out on their own is a pretty good one, actually. Um, you learn a lot. You, you, you'll, I mean, find the, find the discipline and the, and the area you want to be in 
so that you so it becomes a it becomes a transferable skill set that you work. But you're going to learn other intangibles. You're going to learn from the guy who you work for how you'll treat or not treat people. You'll see if you view it as an entrepreneur purely how people react to different kinds of motivation. You'll see it because you'll see how you're motivated or not motivated. You'll understand what a good boss is and a bad boss is, and you'll take traits from both of them, and you'll think of both, about both of them and the way you operate your business. And you'll learn skills. You'll learn the basic skills. You'll learn about accounting, and you'll learn the real world, not the theory of these things. It's, a, it's, it's not a bad idea, it's a very good idea to get some experience watching someone else. Hopefully someone, you've done your homework and you've, and you've invested in someone who you know is successful. Maybe they are in fact in an entrepreneurial venture that's now gone to the next stage. Not a bad idea to do that. I have three children, none of them work for anybody else. They all have their own businesses. They've all, only one of them has ever worked for anybody else. And they've all done okay. I mean, they've got great little businesses, and they didn't want they they saw corporate life through me, and they decided they didn't want to do corporate life. They didn't want to work, you know, 26 hours a day, and you know, not see their families and stuff like that. And look, the investment that you make is if you're an entrepreneur, if you're in a startup business is trying to figure out what balance is. And you'll learn that by watching other people who are, going through, who are going through it. And you'll make a decision as well. And that decision is, you know what? It isn't quite as attractive as I thought it was. Maybe I want to work somewhere where I have more structure around me. You'll learn for yourself what that means. Look, I lost a marriage because I worked 18 hours a day and I came home one night and my wife said to me, I could probably deal with being second. But I'm third. Your job's first and second. I lost a marriage, you know, because I was working 17, 18 hours a day to an incredibly lovely person. But it was the choice I made at the time. There are people in here who will make similar choices, and people in here who should probably sit there and say, well, wait a minute, is that actually the choice I want to make? Is that the life balance issue I want to make? So it's, I'm, and I'm trying to answer your question in a more holistic lifestyle issue than, than just what you asked me. The other part of it is as far as the job search piece to it. And we talked about this at lunch. Um, we talked about the fact that one of the things you need to do is have a unique selling proposition. The, the, the unique selling proposition of you, how are you branding you? What is your brand? How are you unique to the next four guys who are going to come in for that job and that job interview? You guys are on the tail end, I think it was, to be completely factual, it was class of nine, class of ten, with the two largest graduating classes in the history of America. So what do we do? We're so kind to you guys. We, the adults, screwed up the economy to the point at the end of 08, so that when you guys graduate 9, 10, 11, there aren't any jobs out there. And guess what? There are more of you than there have ever been looking for jobs. So it is not the world is your oyster out there. It is not, you know, go out there and give it your best and everything will be all right. It's tough. But so you've got to create a unique selling position for yourself. You have to do more homework than anybody else about the business. So when you walk into that meeting with that guy who's interviewing you, he's got all the options. He's already made a decision whether he wants to see you or not, and that you've got to posit it. The rest of it is, it says, how long is this meeting going to last? If it lasts less than five minutes, move on. Because it was a courtesy meeting and that was about the end of it. Five minutes to ten minutes. But grab the moment and take the moment and be able to prove to that person who's interviewing you that you know more about his business or her business than they do. You know more about what's going on in their business than anybody else could come in here. And by the way, you've thought about what your skills translate to how to contribute to the growth of that business. I noticed, I'm trying to make this up as I've got more. I noticed that you guys in Madison Square Garden or having trouble with naming rights, naming rights deals because you can't ever give up the name Madison Square Garden. So you can't generate the revenue that somebody who wants to do, you know, Comco Park or something like that. So you guys can't do that. You're screwed. But I had to help you. I've been thinking about this. And I've looked at your financials and I've looked at this and 
you, do, you know what you should be doing? Naming your entrances. You know, the Bristol Myers entrance way, the Coors Beer entrance way, the, 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 I'm making it up as I go along, sweets, whatever. There are ways, if you can think that way, not maybe you know, that particular, have that kind of height and awareness of it, but if you start talking to guys like that, he's going to remember you. He's going to think about what you said. Then you follow it up, not just with the note, but you follow it up with a phone call. And it's not just the really thank you so much for seeing me. It's, I'm the guy for this. And every interview is a practice. It's a practice for the one that pays off. It doesn't matter. I don't care if you get a job. Somebody calls you and says, um, I saw your name on the Monmouth College and I saw that you like dogs. There's a gr we have a dog catcher job. Come on and interview. Go interview. Practice. Prove to the guy that there's no job in the whole world you ever wanted besides being that door catcher. Because if you sell yourself that well, you're going to distinguish yourself from somebody else. Do your homework. Follow up. Make sure that whoever's sitting across from you thinks this is the only job you ever want in your life. And then change who has the options. Because that guy's had all the options. Now this guy sits there and says, well, I'd like to bring you back to meet so-and-so. All of a sudden, it's your call. I want to go, do I want to go back? Was I really that interested? Or was this just great practice for me to continue? Or do I want to take the second interview for that very reason, to get even more practice, even though I know I'm not sure I want this job? Or this is the step in the door, and you know that the option decision process is moving a little bit more in your direction. That's where you want to be. I got the options. You want them. So you figure out how to do that by selling yourself in a front room effect with that. That answer your question? Okay. Right. You said you started out with this passion, and we see these entrepreneurs evolve, and I try to tell students the difference between entrepreneurs and managers. And you just told us that you had to hand off the ball to the managers. Did you lose your passion? Is that when the, the MBAs came, and the numbers came, and the statistics came? Did you lose your passion, or did your passion change that? No, you know, we were lucky. We're, they're still lucky. And there are a lot more MBAs, and there are a lot more uh, strategic planning guys, and Mergers and acquisition guys, because MTV is <clears throat> MTV is now arguably a two and a half billion dollar business around the world. MTV networks, more, yeah, probably more. And there are seven thousand employees around. But well, if you call it six thousand employees around the world, from twenty from thirty years ago, from twenty six people, a couple of bucks ago, it's a huge business. If it was valued for purchase. Eight, ten billion dollars. That's the value of it. And so you need these guys who can do these things for you. And we acquire we acquire more businesses over the last several years. They've acquired more businesses. So you do need those skill sets. But what happened was we kept creating new businesses so that the passion and the creativity and you guys, because of your use and your embracing of technology, kept us all creative and kept us engaged. And I mean, the, the best gift you guys give the guys who work at MTV, and me is one of them in my time there, was you kept us on our toes and thinking and, and allowed us to continue, not in a Peter Pan way, but kind of continue to think youthfully because we had to think about what we need to deliver to you guys. And you guys, with what you talk about, the way you absorb information, the technological adeptness that you have, uh, you know, has made such a difference in the way MTV, Nickelodeon, all of which, all of the programming at the, at the at MTV knows is done. And that's because of you guys. You dictated that. And it made me smarter because I wanted to be in kind of, I had to be if I was going to deliver. So, yeah, the passion stays because we kept reinventing ourselves. Um, you mentioned that you made some, some mistakes in the beginning of MTV, and I was just curious. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, we almost went into business with Donald Trump. <laughs> um, I can't believe we did that. Uh, we, 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 were, we wanted to build our own studios. And we were, we were renting studio space for production uh, at a place called Unitel <coughs> on the far west side. Near the, Near the, uh, the, the, uh, the train uh, track area, I can't remember 
it's called anymore. And then, where they store the trains at night and stuff like that. I don't know what it's um, and we were over there, and there's no nowhere. And it wasn't a very good facility. We were growing, we were becoming more, we were doing a lot more production. At one point, uh, it's changed, but at one point, New York, MTV was the largest producer of programming in New York City. Uh, we were, there was so much going on between Nickelodeon and MTV. Um, and Donald Trump announced he was going to do these, he was going to take over the yard, the yards, that's what it was. He was going to build on the yards a media complex with state-of-the-art studios and all this stuff. And so we thought, this is kind of cool. He's going to build this stuff. We could be an anchor tenant. We're, we're doing well enough that everybody knows who we are now, so it would be some cachet for him to have MTV as the first major tenant. So we thought this would be cool. So we go and we negotiate with his, with his, his guys, and we're all, everybody's happy with the terms of the deal. And we're down to it. We're about to announce it. And his brother comes into the room. And his brother says to me, of course it's going to be Donald Trump's MTV studio. If Donald Trump names everything. He's like, if you go to his golf courses, it's Trump water. And, and it was going to be Donald Trump's MTV studios. And it was like, we just stood there. We were, a bunch of, you know, we, we were a little bit naive, a lot naive. We just kind of looked at them and we just said, that's just never going to happen. And they sued us. Huge mistake. They sued us and we lost. We, we lost a lot of money in getting sued. But the fact that we believed where they were taking us, we were so many about it. It was, it was a mistake. I'll tell you a great story about, this says, kind of answered you, kind of about your question, about our naivety and our beliefs. This is a guy named Irving Azov. He was a huge music industry guy. And one of the things he did, he, the Eagles were his band, and Fleetwood Mac was his band, and, he, and he's got a lot of bands now, too. He's also the head of, uh, of a major ticket, uh, ticket truck. But at those days, he ran Universal Music out of Universal Studios in L.A. And Bob Pittman, the guy I talked about a little while ago, said, Dwight, I need you to go out to L.A. We're going to do the video music where he's in L.A. at the back lot there. And we're going to do it at the, the Universal Amphitheater. <coughs> Irving has told us he's going to give us the amphitheater for three, for free to use for this thing. So we go out there and have an initial meeting with Irving Azoff, and he's very nice and blah, blah, blah. And we had a press conference and announced jointly we're, we're moving to the music of the from New York to LA. And I had breakfast with Irving Azoff the next day, and Irving Azoff says, well, here are your costs. And he goes through the costs. And he said, and the amphitheater's going to cost you $400,000. I said, well, wait a minute. You told Bob it was free. And he looked at me across the breakfast table and smiled and said, I lied. Now we can do it. <laughs> <laughs> we, we just had a press conference the morning. We were screwed. <laughs> I, going home and telling Bob that was not fun. Um, but yeah, our naivete in the early parts were up there. That being said, ethics has mattered in your career. Oh God, yeah. And and uh, maybe can you give us an example of where you had an ethical had an ethical situation? <coughs> You had to either make the right choice or you could tell us otherwise. Um, I'll tell you about our business. Um, I'll tell you about I'll tell you about Mon. That's probably a good place to start. You know, a, here's the sales pitch about Mon. I, um, I learned once I took a chip off my shoulder and, and started to embrace. What, what, you can't be anonymous at Monday College. I heard that this morning, and it's absolutely the truth. You guys know it. I'm sure you know it. You can't go around without somebody knowing who you are, what you're doing, and what you're thinking, and how you're doing. And for the most part, there's, a, there's an element of discomfort sometimes with some of us about privacy and that kind of thing. But I think for the most part, there's such sincere concern here about that and about about what you're doing and how you're doing and how you're progressing <coughs> and caring about it. Dr. Tom Fernandez, who Lee knows very, very well, was my was our, my advisor. Your advisor was well, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Our advisor. And he took an unbelievable interest in us. And he cared and screamed and yelled at us like we were you know, idiots when we were. But he cared deeply about us and he knew about us and he knew about my family and he knew about my family. And um, I heard, not under, the, not, under, not, not under the heading of very proud of this, but I was arrested for underage drinking here when I was about 19. And I was thrown in jail, in the Monmouth jail, me and my buddy. And neither one of us had been drinking. 
we were with two buddies who were out to Mississippi who were drinking. And he was sitting there. Anyway, we got arrested. And I'm sitting in the cell, laying in the cell, at like 6 o'clock in the morning, and I hear the clank, and I look up, and there's Tom Fernandez. He bailed me out of jail. He put me in his car, and he drove me back, and he never mentioned it again. Uh, he knew I knew. And I mean, it wasn't anything he could have said that would have been more mortifying or more upsetting to me than the fact that I knew he knew and what I'd done and I would screw up I just been um, He cared about me. He cared about a lot of people, a lot of stuff. And that was what Monmouth was about. And it was, and it was about, you know, kind of like, boy, learn how to do the right thing. You know better. Do the right thing. The guy who runs ESPN is a guy named George Badenheimer. And George Badenheimer did a, I've known him for many, many years. Um, and George is incredibly successful executive as you know, ESPN is a pretty good business, but we'll thank um, And he did a speech down at the uh, University of Pennsylvania about a year ago. And he's got artistic people, and PR people, and press people, and people who put together presentations, and all this stuff. And he spoke to the business school at UPenn, and I tagged along. And he got up, and everybody's you know, sitting there waiting for a speech, and there's the board down. And he clicks on a slide, and the slide says, do the right thing. And he spoke for 45 minutes with one slide, that was it. And everything he talked about with ESPN was doing the right thing, doing it for the right reasons. If, if when you, and, and this goes for MTV owners. One of the things that MTV owners and here taught me about was if you get to do well, then why not do good? So we've been able to do that. And that's one of the, you know, from an ethical standpoint, where we've seen opportunity. <coughs> our live aid campaign, our, you know, we have, we're pro MTV Networks and Viacom is probably the largest supporter of AIDS issues in, in the world. Bill Gates spends more time talking to MTV's uh, folks on this than any, any, anybody else in the world. We spend more money than almost any company you can think of, other than foundations like the Gates Foundation, or the building of the Gates Foundation. Because they want to do the right thing, and they see that. Human trafficking is a huge issue overseas. Coming here, too, sadly and tragically. But it's a huge issue overseas. MTV networks and the international communities is one of the foremost, because unfortunately, it is this age group that's most affected by it, and younger. So there's an enormous, enormous thought about that. Because we do care about audience. And we do care about you guys. And part of it is means we have to deliver something to you, but in turn we have to we have to earn that right and trust. Part of that is to make sure that everybody knows we do care about that. Um, business ethics. We had a uh, you know, it's a we're an <coughs> company. We're 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 governed by a couple of things. We're governed by Sarbanes Oxley, which deals with financial issues financial controls and, ethics, and, and business ethics, as well as the <coughs> Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which deals with exactly that, corrupt practices overseas associated with an American company. It doesn't matter where in the world we are. We're governed by the rules of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. In Italy, we had, we discovered, we had uh, uh, one of the government officials on our payroll. And when we discovered this, and we went, what does he do? Well, he doesn't do anything. He just comes in and collects a paycheck every two weeks. And it's basically, what was the phrase you used this morning? A facilitating payment. Yeah. Yeah. A bribe. Versus a bribe. Versus a bribe. The polite bribe. Um, and, it's, and while in Italy, for Italian companies and other parts of Europe, that's not that's a big surprise or unexpected. It's not acceptable for an American company. And trying to explain to our employees and take them through ethics and <coughs> training in Italy, where they say, but we're Italian. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're Italian. You work for an American company and you're governed by American rules and regulations. So we have those kinds of ethical challenges all over the world with bribes. I'll give you an example where we, where we approved a bribe for a couple of reasons. First, we had a news crew going into Iraq. And they were going, they were going on a border crossing. This was when, when Viacom and CBS. And, I, and they had a border crossing. And at the border crossing, the guard said, you, everybody here has to take an AIDS test. And he opened a box of needles and said, 
we'll, we'll administer the test. Well, the producer said, that's not going to happen. And the only way he was going to get in, and he knew this, was to bribe the guard. So he gave the guard 50 bucks, which was probably a month's pay for the guard. And the guard let them walk through. And we approved it for a couple reasons. One, because the producer made a decision that the welfare of his employees was, was in danger, and the fact that he reported it honestly. He put on his expense report, one bribe, $50. <laughs> 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 so he said, well, how do you argue with a guy who's done that? <laughs> but ethics is, um, I've had the pleasure of talking to Tom about this, and we talked to, I talked to President Distler about this when he was in New York. I mean, uh, what you guys are doing with the concept of ethics, and not just you know, business ethics, but day-to-day -day ethics, and doing the right thing. You, you're on to something. You're really on to something. It's, the country in general wants that kind of stuff. You know, people are hungry and thirsty to see people doing the right things for the right reasons. And if you're engendering a community and a, and a school, where that becomes part of your DNA. And that only can pay off for all of you, personally, professionally, spiritually, if that's the case. Uh, but So you guys are onto something, and I applaud what you're doing. Um, love what you're doing. Have a great time doing it. If you can figure out those two things and make money out of it, you've got to be made. I was blessed. I continue to be blessed, but I was blessed because I found something I love to do. I made a living at it. I was able to take care of my family. I traveled the world. I got to see people and things that I never ever thought. And I kept thinking to myself, I'm just a kid from a small Midwest college. And I continue to think, I, start, I stopped thinking that. So I said, well, that's why I'm here. Because it helped me develop into the guy I am. We got to go here. So I'm done. Thanks. <laughs>